speaking about closer meeting between the East and the West. In 1949, Sri Aurobindo's birthday was celebrated in New York. And on that occasion, Sri Aurobindo was asked to send a message to the West. In this message, he says, the highest truth is truth of the Spirit. A spirit supreme above the world and yet immanent in the world and in all that exists. The East has always and increasingly put the highest emphasis on the supreme truth of the spirit. It has, even in its extreme philosophies, put the world away as an illusion and regarded the spirit as the sole reality. This is the example of Buddhism, Buddhistic nihilism, and the theory of Maya, where this whole world is an illusion. The West has concentrated more and more increasingly on the world, on the dealings of mind and life with our material existence, on our mastery over it, on the perfection of mind and life, and some fulfillment of the human being here. Latterly, this has gone so far as the denial of the spirit and even the enthronement of matter as the sole reality. And that we see with physical science, which only believes in matter, and then the apparition and the growth of atheism and agnosticism in the West. India has, or rather had, the knowledge of the spirit, but she neglected matter and suffered for it. The West has the knowledge of matter, but rejected the spirit and suffers badly for it. But, says Sri spirit and matter are two ends of a unity. Spirit the soul and reality of matter. Matter, the form and body of spirit. There is an ascending series of substance and spirit at the summit is itself pure substance of being. All conscious being is one and indivisible in itself. But in manifestation, it becomes a hierarchy of states or movements. This hierarchy is composed by a descending or involutive and an ascending or evolutive movement, of which spirit and matter are the highest and lowest terms. So we have spirit who involved itself and became matter, plunged into matter, descended into matter, transformed itself into matter. Like steam turns into water, which turns into ice by a process of condensation and crystallization. The spirit and matter are one and the same thing in different states of itself. It's God clothing himself in matter. All is fundamentally the same substance, the same consciousness, the same force, but in different forms and powers and degrees of itself. The spirit involved itself into matter and now from within matter is pushing towards Emergence. And appears first in life, then in mind, and then in supermind. That's the next step. The Western mind is still burdened with its scientific vision of the world as a material entity. 
out of this pure materiality, mind and soul inexplicably evolve. God appears only in man and his aspiration, his longings for a higher order of things. The simple harmonious truth that God is veiled in the material universe, which is only the lowest term, the first appearance of the cosmic reality, that he unveils himself partially and progressively in men and to men, and that men, by growth into self-knowledge and God-knowledge, can grow into the whole truth of God and existence, which is one truth, this seems still to be hidden from these wise men of the West. In fact, to the logical European mind, a belief in one divine being, superior to cosmos, who is all cosmos and who lives in many forms of Godhead, is a hodgepodge, mush, confusion of ideas, for synthesis, intuitive vision, inner experience are not the forte of this strongly external, analytic and logical mind. So to summarize, spiritual perfection as the sole ideal on one side, India, on the other, the perfectibility of the race, the perfect society, a perfect development of the human mind and life and man's material existence in the West, have become the largest dream of the future. Yet both are truths. They are not incompatible with each other. Rather, their divergence has to be healed and both have to be included and reconciled in our view of the future. The ascent of the human soul to the Supreme Spirit is that soul's highest aim and necessity. For that is the supreme reality. But there can be two, the descent of the Spirit and its powers into the world and that would justify the existence of the material world also, give a meaning, a divine purpose to the creation and solve its riddle. East and West could be reconciled in the pursuit of the highest and largest ideal. Spirit embraces matter and matter finds its own true reality and the hidden reality in all things, in the spirit. And this is how Sri Aurobindo ends his message to the West. So the unification of the East and the West is the religion of today. But in this task of unification, if we consider the West as the foundation or the chief support, we shall be making a grievous error. The East is the foundation, the chief support. The outer world is established in the inner, not vice versa. That unity of mankind, the West sees only in idea, but cannot achieve, because it does not possess its spirit. Europe labors to establish unity by accommodation of conflicting interests and the force of mechanical institutions. But so attempted, it will either not be founded at all or will be founded on sand. Meanwhile, she wishes to blot every other culture as if hers were the only truth or all the truth of life, and there were no such thing as truth of the spirit. India, the ancient possessor of the truth of the spirit, must resist that arrogant claim and aggression, and affirm 
her own deeper truths in spite of heavy odds and against all comers. For in its preservation lies the only hope that mankind, instead of marching to a new cataclysm, will at last emerge into the light. So as we have seen, the tendency of the normal Western mind is to live from below upward and from out inward. A strong foundation is taken in the vital and material nature and higher powers are invoked and admitted only to modify and partially uplift the natural terrestrial life. So what is important to this mind are the ground realities, the here and now of the material life. The rest is more abstract. It's good as an influence, a decoration, adornment. On the contrary, India's constant aim has been to find the basis of living in the higher spiritual truth and to live from the inner spirit outward. Now that difference is no unimportant subtlety, but of a great and penetrating practical consequence. And we can see how Europe would deal with any spiritual influence by her treatment of Christianity and its inner rule, which she never really accepted as the law of her life. It was admitted, but only as an ideal and emotional influence and used to chasten and give some spiritual coloring to the vital vigor of the Teuton and the intellectual clarity and sensuous refinement of the Latins. Any new spiritual development she might accept would be taken in the same way and used to a like limited and superficial purpose. And we see that today. The West is opening itself more and more to spiritual influences. But the first thing it does with this new opening is to turn it to the service of the lower nature. All is turned immediately to the satisfaction of the desires. The moment you start feeling abundant and worthy, you are generating wealth. Three law of attraction truths that I wish I knew earlier. Whatever you can see in your mind, you can hold in your hand, whether you want to be a millionaire, so whether you Seven want steps to speed up the law of attraction using your spiritual powers. And the truth is, you can actually get whatever you want in life. Whatever you can see in your mind, you can hold in your hand. Whether you want to be a millionaire, whether you want to give you three ways to manifest money within 24 hours. How would you like to get your ex back? The law of attraction may be the power you need. The West makes life the one aim, takes its elements fundamentally as they are, and only calls in a half-spiritual or pseudo-spiritual light to flush and embellish it. The emphasis of the Western mind is on life, the outer life above all, the things that are grasped, visible, tangible. The inner life is taken only as an intelligent reflection of the outer world. The present use of living to be holy in this life and for this life is all the preoccupation of Europe. Even from religion, the West is apt to demand that it shall subordinate its aim or its effect to this utility of the immediate visible world. In India, on the contrary, here is a philosophy which founds itself on the immediate reality of the infinite, the pressing claim of the absolute. And this 
is not as a thing to speculate about, but as a real presence and a constant power which demands the soul of man and calls it. Here is a mentality which sees the divine in nature and man and animal and inanimate thing. God at the beginning, God in the middle, God at the end, God everywhere. And all this is not a permissible poetical play of the imagination that need not be taken too seriously by life, but is put forward as the thing to be lived, realized, put at the back even of outward action, turned into stuff of thought, feeling and conduct. Here is a country which is still heavily colored with the ochre tint of the garb of the sannyasin, where the beyond is still preached as a truth and men have a living belief in other worlds and reincarnation. Here, the experiences of yoga are held to be as true or more true than the experiments of the laboratory. That which to the Western mind is myth and imagination is here an actuality and a strand of the life of our inner being. What is their beautiful poetic idea and philosophic speculation is here a thing constantly realized and present to the experience. The method of the West is to exaggerate life and to call down as much or as little as may be of the higher powers to stimulate and embellish it. But the method of India is on the contrary to discover the spirit within and the higher hidden intensities of the superior powers and to dominate life in one way or another so as to make it responsive to and expressive of the spirit and in that way increase the power of life. Europe dominates the world and it is natural to forecast a westernized world. We would see then a European unity given up to the rigorous scientific pursuit of the development and organization of material life. Humans built new technological superhighways that reshaped their entire societies. Now they needed something or dare I say, someone, to navigate these new roads and help transform them into the foundation of Civilization 2.0. Enter AI. The beacon of progress of science, innovation, and government bodies worldwide. Across this possibility falls the shadow of India. Because we see that the opposition is not so much between Asia and Europe as between India and the rest of the world. Spirituality is not the monopoly of India, but the difference is between spirituality made the leading motive and the determining power of both the inner and the outer life and spirituality suppressed, allowed only under disguises or brought in as a minor power, its reign denied or put off in favor of the intellect or of a dominant materialistic vitalism. The former way, spirituality reigning, was the type of the ancient wisdom, at one time universal in all civilized countries, literally from China to Peru. But all other nations have fallen away from it and diminished its large pervasiveness or fallen away from it altogether, as in Europe 
or they are now, as in Asia, in danger of abandoning it for the invading economic, commercial, industrial, intellectually utilitarian modern type. And we see indeed that in Asia, China and Japan have definitely grown rationalistic and materialistic and have given up their spirituality. China, Japan and the Middle East are sliding into a blind European imitativeness. India alone has remained faithful to the heart of the spiritual motive. India alone is still obstinately recalcitrant. India alone as a nation, whatever individuals or a small class may have done, has still now refused to give up her worshipped Godhead or bow her knee to the strong reigning idols of rationalism, commercialism and economism, the successful iron gods of the West. Affected she has been, but not yet overcome. So the issue can be so stated. Does the future of humanity lie in a culture founded solely upon reason and science? Is the progress of human life the effort of a mind, a continuous collective mind, in search of some clear light and some sure support amidst its difficulties and problems? And does civilization consist in men's endeavor to find that light and support in a rationalized knowledge and a rationalized way of life? This is the formula which European civilization has accepted and is still laboring to bring into some kind of realization. The formula of an intelligently mechanized civilization supporting a rational and utilitarian culture. This effort of the reason to organize life will end up in totalitarianism, says Sri Aurobindo. Humans are now hackable animals. You know, the, the whole idea that humans have, you know, this, they, they have this soul or spirit and they have free will, that's over. It is not with impunity that men decide to believe that they are animals and God does not exist, he says. For what we believe, that we become. A social tyranny, more terrible, inquisitorial and relentless than any we have ever seen before, is going to come out of this effort. And because he is still free to gratify his senses and enjoy himself, the European thinks himself free. He does not know what teeth are gnawing into the heart of his liberty. Or is not the truth of our being rather that of a soul embodied in nature, which is seeking to know itself, to find itself, to enlarge its consciousness, to arrive at a greater way of existence, to progress in the spirit and grow into the full light of self-knowledge and some divine inner perfection. Because that is the idea of life and being for which India still strives to stand. It is the formula of a spiritualized civilization striving through the perfection, but also through an exceeding of mind, life and body towards a high soul culture. So, whether the future hope of the race lies in a rational and an intelligently mechanized or in a spiritual, intuitive and religious civilization and culture, that then is the important issue. The gulf between East and West, India and Europe, is much less profound and unbridgeable now than it was 30 or 40 years ago. 
in the life of the West, an immense change is in progress, a reaching towards deeper things, an increasing return of seekings which had been banished, an urge towards higher experience yet unrealized, an admission of ideas long foreign to the Western mentality can be seen everywhere. However, the basic difference between India and the West still remains. The life of the West is still chiefly governed by the rationalistic idea and the materialistic preoccupation. And this is why the country whose main principle of education is the value of the inner attitude and non-attached activity, only in such a country, by its synthesis of the inner and the outer, the East and the West, can the social, economic and political problems find a satisfactory and practical solution. But we shall not be able to arrive at a solution if we follow Western knowledge and education. We shall have to assimilate the West by standing firm on the basis of the principles of the East. It is India that can bring truth in the world. By manifestation of the divine will and power alone, India can preach her message to the world, and not by imitating the materialism of the West. By following the divine will, India shall shine at the top of the spiritual mountain and show the way of truth and organize world unity. In the next great stage of human progress, says Sri Aurobindo, it is not a material, but a spiritual, moral and psychical advance that has to be made. And for this, India must take the lead. So with India rests the future of the world. Whenever she is aroused from her sleep, she gives forth some wonderful shining ray of light to the world, which is enough to illuminate the nations. God gave to her the book of ancient wisdom and bade her keep it sealed in her heart until the time should come for it to be opened. When India sleeps, materialism grows apace and the light is covered up in darkness. But when materialism thinks herself about to triumph, lo and behold, a light rushes out from the east. And where is materialism? Returned to her native night. From the spiritual point of view, says Mother, India is the foremost country in the world. Her mission is to set the example of spirituality. Sri Aurobindo came on earth to teach this to the world. And Mother expands further on this. She says, all countries are equal and essentially one. Each of them represents an aspect of the One Supreme. In the terrestrial manifestation, they all have the same right to a free expression of themselves. From the spiritual point of view, the importance of a country does not depend on its size or its power or its authority over other countries but on its response to truth and on the degree of truth it is capable of manifesting. In June 1967, a war broke out between Egypt and Israel. And there was an American boy in the ashram at the time who had been a paratroop in the Israeli army. 
And he had decided that if the war was going to start, he would go back to Israel and help them. So he decided to leave and he went to see the mother. Mother saw him and she tells us what happened. So, she says, I spoke. You understand? It was my mouth that spoke then, but it was Sri Aurobindo who spoke. Then I concentrated and Sri Aurobindo said with great force, All the country lives in fortune. If only one country stood courageously the truth, the world might be changed. So towards the end of the day, when I was alone, I began asking Shorobindo precisely what he meant. Naturally, his hope is that the country that stood for truth would be India. For the moment, she is very far from it, but... And that was in June 1967. Two years later, in April 1969, India is facing a potential Chinese invasion. And Indira Gandhi, who is the prime minister, all of a sudden realized that she does not have the required knowledge or the required power to face the circumstances. So she told Nandini, a friend of hers, who was also a minister in the government and was a disciple of the mother, to go to the mother and ask her for her advice. She says... There is only one country in the world that knows that there is only one truth to which everything should be turned, and that is India. Other countries have forgotten this. But in India, it is ingrained in the people. And one day, it will come out. We must all recognize this and work for this. India is the cradle of the truth and will lead the world to truth. India will find its real place in the world when it realizes this. Already 15 years before that, in 1954, the mother had said, the future of India is very clear. India is the guru of the world. The future structure of the world depends on India. India is the living soul. India is incarnating the spiritual knowledge in the world. The government of India ought to recognize the significance of India in this sphere and plan their action accordingly. So it looks like now the time has come for India to rise up to her mission. Asia is the custodian of the world's peace of mind, the physician of the maladies which Europe generates. She is commissioned to rise from time to time and rule the world for a season so that the world may come and sit at her feet to learn the secrets she alone has to give. When the restless spirit of Europe has added a new phase of discovery to the evolution of science of material life, has regulated politics, rebased society, remodeled law, rediscovered science, the spirit of Asia, calm, contemplative, self-possessed, takes possession of Europe's discovery and corrects its exaggerations, its aberrations, by the intuition, the spiritual light she alone can turn upon the world. The strength of Europe is in details. The strength of Asia is in synthesis. When Europe has perfected the details of life or thought, she is unable to harmonize them into a perfect symphony 
and she falls into intellectual heresies, practical extravagances, which contradict the facts of life, the limits of human nature, and the ultimate truths of existence. It is therefore the office of Asia to take up the work of human evolution when Europe comes to a standstill and loses itself in a clash of vain speculations, barren experiments and helpless struggles to escape from the consequences of her own mistakes. Such a time has now come in the world's history. The West, says Sri Aurobindo, has developed materially and on the surface, but has not sought for strength and permanence in the deeper roots of life, of which our outer activity is only a partial manifestation. It is this moral strength this ability to go to the roots, this gift of diving down into the depths of self and drawing out the miraculous powers of the will, this command over one's own soul, which is the secret of Asia. And he who is in possession of his soul, the scripture assures us, shall become the master of the world. The peoples of Europe have carried material life to its farthest expression. The science of bodily existence has been perfected. But they are suffering from diseases which their science is powerless to cure. The life of the Hindu is inward. His outward life, like that of other nations, is subject to growth and decay. But while other nations have a limit and a term, he has none. Whenever death claims his portion, the Hindu race takes refuge in the source of all immortality, plunges itself into the fountain of spirit, and comes out renewed for a fresh term of existence the elixir of national life has been discovered by India alone. This immortality, this great secret of life, she has treasured up for thousands of years until the world was fit to receive it. The time has now come for her to impart it to the other nations who are now on the verge of decadence and death. Oh, India, land of light and spiritual knowledge, wake up to your true mission in the world. Show the way the union and harmony.